there's this common belief that people's distress is maximal immediately after an event. But if we follow populations over long periods of time, the most common pattern is for people's symptoms to emerge two, three, five years after the event. Hello and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today we are beginning a 14-week series on post-traumatic stress disorder. In this series, we are going to cover a wide range of clinical and lived experience perspectives. PTSD is brought on by exposure to traumatic experiences and is said that 6% of the population will have it at some point in their lives. We begin our series talking with Professor Alexander McFarlane from the University of Adelaide. Professor McFarlane is considered to be an international expert in this field and was awarded an Order of Australia medal for his work in it. Hello Alex and welcome to Wellbeing. It's a pleasure. Many have heard the term PTSD, but what actually is it? PTSD is a state of mind that people develop after being exposed to horrific traumatic events. I think one of the things that's changed in recent times is we understand really the role of cumulative trauma, whereas the disorder is very much diagnosed around people's exposure to single events, you know, such as a horrific motor vehicle accident, being a victim of crime, being a victim of sexual assault. You know, obviously there are other populations where it's the cumulative exposure which counts, such as in the military and, and police personnel, and they're really sort of set several key elements to post-traumatic stress disorder. The first thing is that with most events, with the passage of time, we slowly, the memory will sort of dissipate. The difficulty with the people with PTSD is that the memory of the event stays in the forefront of their awareness. So it really becomes something that sort of sits between them and their day-to-day life where there are all sorts of triggers in their environment which will bring back these horrific memories. It disrupts their sleep through nightmares. These memories just spontaneously come to mind. And how people try and deal with that is by trying to avoid those thoughts, to try and repress them, try, they'll start to constrict their activities because they don't want to go into environments where those sorts of memories are brought back. The other thing is that they sort of shut down emotionally. They become withdrawn, lose their ability to enjoy things. Against the background of you know a whole range of anxiety symptoms where they can't sleep, can't concentrate, very vigilant about environments because of the risk of danger, they startle more. So it's just sort of this complex pattern of reactivity to these memories and the strategies that people try and uh, use to adopt to them. What parts of the brain does it directly affect? Look, increasingly it's not just a single part of the brain. What we need to think about is that reaction to threat and adversity involves your whole body. The, the quick and primitive responses to threat uh, are directed from the brainstem into the, into the autonomic nervous system, which controls things like gut function, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, muscle tone, etc. But then as the threat stimulus goes up to the brain, there are a whole series of different systems that, that respond. The first one is the fear networks in the brain, which drive obviously reflexive reactions. But then there's the frontal part of the brain, which is really the executive part of the brain that really decides, is this something I need to address? Is this something that I can manage? And obviously also your motor systems and the parts of the cortex that are involved in the regulation of your physiology all come into play. And in post-traumatic stress disorder, essentially through wear and tear, those networks and the way they speak to each other get gets significantly disrupted. How prevalent would you say that it is? Well, we, we, we know that quite precisely because there have now been three studies done that are representative studies of the entire Australian population. The, the, only the second one has been published, the third one is currently being analysed, showed that about 4.4% of the Australian population had a post-traumatic stress disorder. So in fact, it's a far more common condition than people would have thought, mm. say, 30 or 40 years ago. In fact, it's probably, there's some evidence that it might in fact be the most common psychiatric disorder in the Australian community, which I think is very surprising. And, and I think it also reflects on the fact that, you know, I think the service delivery systems for dealing with people with trauma are very underdeveloped. And I think, you know, the health administrators really haven't reacted to that, uh, to that epidemiological evidence. We know that in other populations, such as uh, the Defence Force and, and emergency services, the rates are significantly higher. Is it easy for everyday people just walking around, easy to identify the PTSD in others? No, look, it's, it, it is, it's a difficult issue for a number of reasons. I think, first of all, you know, people who are suffering from symptoms, you know, often really don't quite understand the nature of their reactivity. A very simple example, I'll never forget treating a man who'd been buried alive, but he couldn't get to sleep. And one of the reasons why he couldn't get to sleep is that he couldn't tolerate the touch of a sheet on top of him, because that was enough to remind him of the weight of the sand that he'd been buried under. But he made no link to the sheet 
and being better. So, that, you know, often people will present to their doctors or you know, their general practitioners with anxiety. The link back to, to these events is often missed. The other issue, important part about it is, that, as I described before, a lot of people are very avoidant about um, reminders, which includes speaking about the event, so that it, you know there's a whole series of issues that conspire to stop people from really describing their symptoms or talking about them, or because you know they also try and sort of put these events out of their mind. Is there a usual onset for it, or does PTSD really know no age? Very important question. See, one of the the, the, the things that I think has made us sort of get it wrong, and often you see this in the management of disasters or other large-scale community events, Every there's, there's this common belief that, that people's distress is maximal immediately after an event. In some ways, that's been encouraged by people doing short-term studies of populations like you know, motor accident victims or disaster victims. But if we follow populations over long periods of time, what we find is that these symptoms progressively emerge. The most common pattern is for people's symptoms to emerge two, three, five years after the event. Yeah, we've done a longitudinal study of the Australian Defence Force. We're looking at soldiers coming back from deployment. We've studied them before they went on deployment, after deployment, and then five years later. And you find that most of those who've got PTSD at five years had only relatively minor symptoms when they returned from deployment. So I think that's one of the other challenges for people in linking their distress to an event, that, it, that the maximal distress doesn't necessarily... In some people it does, but in a significant number of people... There's this delay in, in emergence of these symptoms. Is there a genetic predisposition at all with it? That's a very interesting question, and it's been looked at in a number of ways. I mean, I was involved in a study in the US where there were 2,000 uh, identical twin pairs who were deployed to Vietnam. Well, in fact, what they did, if anybody had seen the film Saving Private Ryan, they sent one twin to Vietnam and the other twin somewhere else. So essentially one twin had been combat exposed and the other twin wasn't. And we were able to then study the, the twin pairs and to see you know, how much of the physiology, et cetera, that you see in, in post-traumatic stress disorder was determined by genetics as against the environmental exposure. And it, essentially it showed that there are you know, some genetic elements, but really the environmental exposure is the critical issue. And the other issue is that you know, there are aspects of genes which are not what you'd think they'd be. For example, your personality is determined genetically, but your personality determines your trauma exposure. So you know, what was found in that twin study is that the, 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 the veterans who you know, had, were novelty seekers didn't avoid harm and were socially independent, which we generally see as adaptive personality traits, were more likely to get PTSD because they, they were the ones who you know, joined the commandos or the SAS, whereas the people who were you know, more timid, avoided danger, didn't like novelty, were socially dependent would become a cook. And you're obviously much more likely to get PTSD in the battlefield than you are mm. in the kitchen. So, so, so genetics play interesting roles. The other thing is that they've now, you know, since the genome has been mapped, there, you know, there've been some very significant sort of studies of, of the genetic risk for PTSD. And there's some interesting stories there. There's no single or, or um, gene, but there's a, a complex set of genes. But some of them, for example, the gene that predisposed to rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis. And one of the things that we know is that in PTSD inflammation is an important mechanism. And it's one of the reasons why people with PTSD will often have a whole range of physical symptoms. And that's the other thing that sort of distracts them from sort of understanding the psychological disorder because it's actually their change in their physical health that it often will lead to their first presentation to a doctor. Does PTSD look different in children or affect children differently? Look, it's, it, it's in many ways very similar, but, you, you know, obviously children um, can't articulate their thoughts and feelings in the same way. So in children, for example, it's often sort of manifest through play and behavioural difficulties. You know, one of the important issues there is that, you know, I think often kids who are subject to significant physical and sexual abuse, you know, will be identified in classrooms as children who've got behavioural problems. And I think, unfortunately, there's are too ready a propensity to push them into the attention deficit disorder basket, the ADHD basket, rather than seeing the role of, of trauma in, in those behavioural disturbances. When someone gets PTSD, or develops it rather, how long can it stay with them? Probably one of the best studies was a study that was done of American Vietnam veterans in 1990 where they followed them up 25 years later. And if anything, the rates of disorder are higher 25 years later than they were in 1990. So, you, you know, for many people, this is a chronic and really very disabling disorder. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast.
Today we are talking to PTSD expert Alexander McFarlane from the University of Adelaide. What has gotten better about how we, we treat it or how we look at it? Because as you mentioned there, we had higher numbers in the Vietnam vets than to what we have now. What has gotten better over that period of time? There's been a great deal of effort put into trying to identify what are the most effective treatments. And uh, you know, one of the important things is the contributions of people who've had the condition, their willingness to get involved in treatment trials. And then you know, people have tried to refine those treatments things like cognitive behaviour therapy, cognitive reprocessing therapy, rapid eye movement, desensitisation therapy, you know, the use of medication also plays a very important role for, for some people. I mean, one of the other things is that PTSD is not a disorder that just exists by itself. Quite often, people will have very significant depressive symptoms that also need to be treated, and there's another group of people who also try and self-medicate with alcohol and at times, unfortunately, other drugs. So, you, you, you know, your treatment needs to be very broadly focused, and there are also a series of medical conditions. You know, people are more likely to get high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, uh, autoimmune diseases. So, you know, managing those risks is also very much part of the deal. And, you know, I think in, with time, we've come to understand, you know, the strategies as to how to optimally assist in those domains. Would you say that there's a lot of stigma around PTSD or is society becoming a lot more understanding of it? Well, one of the reasons why PTSD was first included in DSM-3, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association in 1980, was that uh, the Vietnam veterans felt extremely stigmatised by the other psychiatric diagnoses that were being used. The, the evidence that PTSD exists goes back a very long way. It was the, what we would describe as the syndrome was first described back in about 1890. It, it, it was a political diagnosis in World War One because it was really seen to... I mean, there were some suggestions that diagnosing people with the condition is what caused it, which was ridiculous, mm. um, rather than the horrors of the war. But the Vietnam veterans managed to, with a group of psychiatrists, you know, I think really refocus people's attention on, on the impact of trauma exposure because it had less stigma. And so that, you know, in a way, it's it's been an important diagnosis to really argue, look, you know, this is not something that, you know, that you can hold people... We well, can't diminish people for this. It's it's something that positive the, the horrific adversity that they've been exposed to. You know they've been unfortunate enough to suffer. That doesn't mean that stigma doesn't still remain. I mean one of the interesting things is that people who develop significant symptoms of depression and anxiety and the symptoms of PTSD will often be incredibly self-critical, and their own self-stigma is one of the real barriers to people focusing in, into treatment because I think well you know other people have been through this have managed. So what, what's what's wrong with me? And feel they feel very diminished by their symptoms, which is, you know, I think one of the tragedies that sometimes is the barrier, barriers to care. Are there medications that help people that have PTSD? Yes, there are. Um, I mean, one of the classes of drugs that I think really have the best evidence for is the antidepressant class of drugs. And, you know, the, the, I think one of the unfortunate things in psychiatry is that we call those drugs antidepressants because they actually are very good for treating particular types of anxiety disorders. They're good for treating depression. They're good for treating post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's not that they sort of specifically affect mood. You know, rather what happens in a condition like PTSD and depression is that the brains, the different parts of your brain that are involved in driving your judgment and your response to your environment and the processing of incoming information, the connectivity between those different parts of your brain get disrupted. And these, these drugs, in a sense, help bind the brain back together again. So it's a bit like, you know, the brain in something like PTSD is like a symphony orchestra where the conductor's fallen off the podium, where the, you know, the first violin's not playing with the cellos. Whereas, you know, when people get put on medication, you can actually show in, in studies of brain function how the brain begins to work much better as a coordinated whole. Can people have a shorter lifespan because they have PTSD? Yeah, uh, there's some good evidence about that. I mean, people with PTSD um, probably lose about four, four years of their life expectancy, and it's because of the associated physical comorbidities I mentioned before, like diabetes, cancer, autoimmune disease. And, you know, of course, there's the tragedy of suicide. You, 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 after World War One, the RSL lobbied the government because they were convinced that soldiers returning from World War One who'd fought on the Western Front had were dying prematurely. They called it the burnt-out soldier effect. And it was one of the first um, epidemiological studies ever, ever done at that time. And it actually did show that there was a significant decrease in life expectancy as a consequence of that trauma exposure.
How much support is out there for those that are affected by PTSD? Well, I think one of the problems is that services for people with PTSD are very fragmented. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's so fragmented is that you, you know, you've got, for example, with emergency services, you'll have a different health service for, in every state for the police, the ambulance service, the fire service and state emergency service. You know, ideally what you'd do would be to have a coordinated health service that would deal with emergency service personnel, not only in states but across Australia, equally with veterans. You know, uh, repatriation network of hospitals has closed down and I think there's a lack of having a, a proper system of care for veterans. I mean, people can go and see individual private practitioners or people in various sort of venues, but there isn't sort of any proper oversight uh, of that system. You know, vi victims of sexual assault and victims of crime, I think, are in a particularly difficult situation to, to, to get um, uh, health care. I mean, a accident victims, you've got all the different workers' compensation and motor accident commission systems that pay for people. So you can see that the funding streams are all over the place. And there should really be a whole of government response. Now, there was um, an inquiry uh, in, in the Senate that looked into this a couple of years ago, but it, unfortunately, the, the federal government really has very little control. This is an issue at a state based level. And the other thing is that the state governments actually have a real conflict of interest here because, you know, they are the employer of the emergency service personnel. They try, often try and resist the compensation claims rather than actually uh, accepting their responsibility to care for these people. So there are some interesting issues that conspire uh, against the development of good treatment services. Can PTSD lead to substance abuse at all? Oh, very much so. And uh, there's evidence that actually shows that alcohol can ameliorate some of the symptoms of, of PTSD. I mean, in fact, there was a study done in World War I showed but if a soldier took a tot of rum before they went over the top, you know, you know when, when, when a battle started, they were less likely to get shell shock than if they didn't take rum. Now, I'm not proposing that people sort of self-medicate with alcohol, but the, the, the fact that alcohol does tend to ameliorate symptoms obviously can encourage people to abuse alcohol down that pathway. So, you know, the, an important issue is to understand that risk. I mean, I, in one study I did, I found that, you know, people who develop PTSD, you know, these were uh, firefighters after Ash Wednesday, either stopped drinking because there's some people who start to get an aversive effect of alcohol or they tended to increase their consumption. So the real challenge for people after these events is actually not to change your pattern of drinking. Alcohol probably, you know, does have a de slight protective effect against trauma, but the important thing is that people, you know, mustn't start abusing it. Can people recover from PTSD? Oh, yes. I mean, there are some very good and effective uh, treatments. Uh, I mean, one of the important issues is that the longer somebody has symptoms, the probability of getting a good treatment response goes down. You know, that's well mapped out in all, m most psychiatric disorders. And it's because, you know, in a sense, once the, the switches have occurred that change the biological and neurotransmitter pathways, the longer they remain in place, the more entrenched they become. I mean, the other issue is that people, in accommodating to their, to their distress and, and their difficulties, sort of begin to adapt sort of a lifestyle that accommodates to their symptoms, and it's much more difficult to change that down the track if it becomes very entrenched. Are you working on any research at the moment? Well, look, I, I have um, uh, retired from the university uh, a, a year ago, and one of the reasons why I did that is that um, the Royal Commission into the um, Suicide of Veterans is currently underway. And previously, I'd got a great deal of um, uh, search funding through Defence and the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I've also reached a stage in my career where I think it's important that you know I try and um, speak you know unencumbered and without any conflicts of interest. So at the moment. You know, look, I'm, I'm uh, actually writing a book about the history of the trauma field based on a whole series of interviews I, I, I've done over the last five years with the founders of the field. And, uh, I mean, I'm still continuing to consult to, to various uh, government departments and, um, uh, and and I still see patients. Um, so, yes, but it's a... So I've really got to that point in my career where I really want to reflect and, and try and sort of um, write down some of my lessons in, in a book rather than simply writing academic papers. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. Today we are talking to PTSD expert Alexander McFarlane from the University of Adelaide. If you like this content, check out the other episodes we have on the list. Can PTSD affect the genders differently? Yeah, I mean, again, there's very good epidemiological evidence that women are at significantly greater risk. And, you know, that's partly, uh, and again, people have studied 
the effects of the menstrual cycle. You know, whether a person, a woman gets tra- traumatised in the first half of the menstrual cycle or the second half of the menstrual cycle with their different hormonal profiles. And it does show that, you know, those hormones actually do have an impact on your risk. So women are more, more vulnerable to trauma. What are the ways that a family member or friend can help someone that does have PTSD? Look, I think the first issue is if, if anything, you know, horrific happens to a person, the most important thing is to get them to focus on feeling safe afterwards. You know, because it's a very interesting question. If, you know, if you've been involved in a horrific motor vehicle accident, when does the accident actually finish? It's not the moment you come to rest. You know, it might be, you know, after two weeks of multiple procedures in hospital where, you know, the consequences of, you know, finally become manifest. So, you know, one of the really important things is, you know, when the threat has passed, to get people to try and re-establish that sense of safety. And I think family members, you know, play a very, very important role in that in that process. I mean, I think the second thing is that family members are often the ones who, you know, um, observe the changes in somebody's thinking and behaviour. You know, if, if it, a person is being adversely affected, you know, to really encourage them to, to seek care and assistance. You know, I mean, because one of the tragedies is that you know, often people with PTSD become more irritable and aggressive. Um, and if you're irritable and aggressive, you'll, you'll look at the person who you think is making you irritable and aggressive and blame them for their behaviour. So, you know, it's a difficult dynamic mm. trying to get family members to say to somebody, look, I, look, I think, you know, what happened to you has changed you a bit. And look, I, you know, you know, we, we need to look after each other here. And the way for us to do that is for us to, you know, get you to go and see your local doctor and see if your local doctor can uh, organise some care for you. After the person with the PTSD has gone to the doctor, what are some of the strategies that they can have to keep living life? And there are a number of things. Uh, look, obviously the first thing to do is to um, get into the treatment stream. And, and, and look, the first thing is if you go to one practitioner and they don't get it, because you know, not, not all practitioners are equally good at sort of helping you, go to another one. You know, don't don't... If somebody says no, don't don't sort of stop there. Um, you know, look. The the, se- the second thing is, I, I, I probably the most important thing for people to do is to try and understand what are the triggers in their environment. Because let, let's say you've been involved in a in a horrific motor vehicle accident and you were hit by a red car. You know, the colour red might become a trigger for you in your environment. What tends to happen is that it's not just red cars, just the colour red. You know, somebody's wearing a red shirt, and you'll get an anxiety reaction. It's very simple. You know, smells will do the same thing. Um, you know, after a, after a motor vehicle accident, it can be the smell of, of, of you know, diesel or petrol on an engine uh, or um, uh, the smell of burnt rubber. And, and but the, the, the really important thing is for people, when they have those sorts of reactions, is to think about the difference between the trigger and the event. So they, they sort of try and break that, that, that nexus, that conditioned response, because that conditioned response is what progressively drives the increasing amplitude of people's reactivity. They become much more reactive to all sorts of little cues in their environment. And, and, and getting somebody to very consciously sort of think through that and to see, to, so you can almost park the trauma back in its space the trouble is that the traumatic memory becomes what almost sits between you and your current life and you interpret everything in terms of that horrific event, you know, obviously because you don't want to go back there. But it's, it's about how you begin to see the world for what it is beyond that memory, which is the really important thing. Is it possible for someone to recover but then it comes the PTSD can redevelop? Yes, uh, I, I, and that can particularly happen if they get exposed to an event that's similar again, because they're obviously primed to those sort of conditioned reactions. Uh, and we also know that you, your, your response to traumatic events is cumulative. You know, the probability of you getting PTSD after each trauma increases because one of the things that, that you've got to do to get better is to increase, is you, you, you have to, in a sense, increase the brakes on, on your inhibitory systems in your brain to stop your reactivity. But the problem is that those breaks can wear out with time as well. So ageing, sometimes people have coped with events for a very long period of time, but the effects of ageing on the frontal lobes and their inhibitory functions over um, regions of the brain like the amygdala and the hippocampus, um, you know, people will, 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 will develop PTSD in late life because of those effects of ageing.
what would be the take home from this interview you'd want people to remember the most? I think the 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 most important thing is to realise that these sorts of horrific experiences can leave lasting events, their lasting reactions in people. And if those reactions don't settle pretty quickly with time, you know, it is important to deal with them because it's it's letting them become ingrained um, that leads to really uh, long-term, you know, adverse consequences. Look, I think another really important thing we haven't discussed, but, you know, we, 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 we speak a lot about trauma in, 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 you know, not triggering people in, 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 in sort of current culture. And I think the word trauma has been diluted a bit. You know, I think we've underestimated people's resilience. I think that's the other thing. You know, there's almost an expect- expectation now that everybody's going to be traumatised by everything. Well, that's not the case. You know, I think trauma can actually teach you a sense of mastery. Um, it can teach you how to understand yourself. And, you know, there, there are many people, you know, in the military and the emergency services who cope day after day, you know, health professionals, um, who cope day after day with these things. And because of their professional skill and and, and their, their degree of... Um, uh, capacity manage them and and i think it's important that societies don't exaggerate the effects of trauma because otherwise we wrap ourselves up in cotton wool and and actually i think don't um, challenge ourselves or the community enough well it was great having you on the show today alex no it's a pleasure my guest today was alexander mcfarlane from the university of adelaide If you liked this episode, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more and tune in next week where we talk with another PTSD expert, Dr. Shelley Jane. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins, and all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.